I'm going to I'm going to just uh, uh, briefly go over what we're doing here. So R Dr. Richard Young and I are the co-chairs of the cost analysis working group for the Committee on the Advancing of the Science of Family Medicine, which is a group that is closely connected to NAPCREG, which uh, is the North American Primary Care Research Group. Our main job with this work uh, with this working group is to help support the development of skills in economic evaluation and other aspects of health uh, economics. If you're interested in um, being involved with this working group, please uh, do let uh, folks know uh, through NAPCREG um, and we will add you to our email list. This is the first of three webinars we're hoping to have. Um, the, just so that folks have it, the next one is going to be on Wednesday, June the 22nd. Uh, from 12 to 1 Eastern time, and it will be with Ahmed Bayoumi. So this uh, this is featuring uh, Dr. Juan Rudy, who is a colleague of mine here at St. Michael's Hospital. She is a health economist and leading the Center for Excellence on for Economic Analysis Research, or the CLEAR unit, here at St. Mike's Hospital. And she's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And she spends a lot of time helping support others with conducting economic evaluations and leading them herself, um, whether it's alongside a trial or are independent. And um, as you can see from her bio, she's, uh, she's experienced it with a number of different methods. I'm going to turn it over to her. And what we're going to do is um, have her present for about 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll have time for questions. OK? Juan Rudy. So, thank you, Andrew. And So thank you, Andrew, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So the talk that I have prepared for all of us today is really an invitation to all of you to economic evaluation. I'd like to take the first few minutes to kind of set the context a little bit, and then I would like to answer three different questions together. The first one is the so what question. Why do economic evaluation? Why should we care about this? Second question is around, well, what, is, what exactly is it? That's going to focus on two parts. The first one being the questions that this type of technique can help you answer. And the second part will look into the general factors that we want to consider when you are thinking about economic evaluation or when you're preparing your grant and think that this type of technique may be helpful. And the last question will focus on what does cost-effective mean? You hear people use this term a lot. So what do they mean? Are they thinking about the same thing that you are? So, But just uh, before we begin the uh, disclaimer, so in this presentation, this view are my view and not the view of, of the people or place with whom I work. So when you think about economics, a lot of time people also think about things like health economics. So I'd like to take just one or two minutes here just to set the context of where economic evaluation fits within this discipline. As this picture is trying to illustrate, health economy is a discipline which has many, many different branches. So we got things like supply and demand, market equilibrium, where only one component focus on economic evaluation. And that is what this webinar will be focusing on. Now, um, today I'm going to cover just the, the, the three questions that I just showed you. And Dr. Bayumi will subsequently, uh, in the next portion, will talk about different case studies or how he has used this type of technique. So this is where economic evaluation fits in, in terms of health economics. But where does economic evaluation fit in if you think about your research or your project? A lot of time is in the evaluation process. So you are an, an expert in your topic, in your area. You have ideas on how to improve clinical outcome. You could be thinking or have idea around a new health program, a new health innovation technology device that can improve the outcome of your interest. Once you have those ideas, you may also want to know whether does it really work. That's where the evaluation part come in. And when you think about the evaluation, there are different components that people can think about. These are some of the examples. First thing people may think about is something around the safety. Is it safe? 
So if it improves certain outcome but is not safe, it may not be something that we want to continue. Efficacy look at the question of does it work in the control setting? Because if it doesn't work in the control setting, it's likely that in the real world where there are many things that we cannot control, you may not, it may also not work. Effectiveness is the one that look at does it work in the real world setting. Efficiency is what we're going to focus on today. And a lot of time people consider this item as hurdle. So efficiency or the cost effectiveness sometimes referred to as the fourth hurdle. So by the time you get to the third hurdle, you already know that your intervention or program is safe, it works in the control setting, it works in every day or in the real world setting. We are now going to talk about the fourth part, the efficiency part. So, but please allow me to just pause here and highlight that. The question of does it work, in, in no mean that I'm saying that it is not important. Does it work is a very important, sometimes the most important question. The, what I would like to focus on today is just to propose that there may be more than one piece of the puzzle. And the second part here will focus on helping you answer the question of is it, is your idea, your intervention cost effective as well. So you can think of this as something that could complement your primary analysis. So you're, when you're preparing a grant, you're going to have your primary outcome. Your primary research question could be does something work to improve the outcome of your interest. Your secondary question, or at least one of your secondary questions, could focus on if it's cost effective as well. So that is how uh, one possible way where economic evaluation could fit within your research program. So back to the back to the outline. So, but really, why do we care about economic evaluation? So why do economic evaluation? Some of you may have heard of a movie called Catch Me If You Can starring Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio. So this movie is about a gentleman who has many, many skills. He, I think by the time he was 18, he was practicing as a doctor, lawyer, a co-pilot in the major airline. And another skill that he has is he's a really great forger. In other words, he can create money out of a blank paper. So out of a blank paper, he can create checks or money order. Now, if that was the skill that everybody has, and more importantly, if that was something that is legal, then the role of economic or economic relations would be very, very different because we can create money. The thing is, and the last time I checked, is those are not an easy skill and, well, more importantly, is not legal. So that's where economic comes in. Economic, as a field, strives to analyze and assist when you have to make choices. So in a simplified definition, economic is about two things. It's about objective and constraint. It's about how we can help you get to your objective, whether it is to maximize the number of patients treated, to maximize the clinical outcome you're looking at, but taking into account the constraints that you face, limited time, limited resources, limited space, limited personnel. So in a lot of ways, it is about dealing with scarcity and trade-off. Now when we face with limited resources, or may sometimes may not be limited, but fixed resources, we have to make choices. So why do economic relations? Because in today's society, a lot of time resources are limited or fixed. Therefore, we have to make choices. There are many different ways we can make choices. Some are more subjective, some are more objective. Economic evaluation is one of the techniques that can help you with that. So economic evaluation is simply a tool, it's a technique, it's a method that will help you compare two or more programs. When you have two or more options, economic evaluation can come in and help you compare and it will look at both cost and outcome at the same time. Sometimes when people think about both cost and outcome, people also think about the terms such as value for money. The money is the cost part, part, and the value can be defined in many different ways. Now I would like to highlight one part here, which is 
the purpose, the overall purpose of economic relations, which is to inform decision making. In other words, it is not to make a decision for you. Our goal is to create another piece of evidence from an economic perspective to help you and your stakeholder when you have to make that decision. So, <clears throat> so decision to a certain level should not be made entirely or solely only on economic relations because there are many different components that we cannot capture or quantify into numbers. So follow on on the definition of economics. Now I'd like to continue and talk about well what exactly is it? What can it give us and what do we need? But before I continue, I'd like to ask if you could think about sparing. So imagine if you think about sparing, regardless of where you are, if somebody were to stare at you, what would the, be the feeling that you have? I would think that it may be associated with somewhat uh, a negative feeling. You may not be feel that comfortable. You may be thinking, do I have something on my shirt? Do I have something on my face? Because people keep staring at me. And I'm with you on that, because that would be the feeling I would have as well. But can you think of a place or where staring isn't strange, weird, or in this case, creepy? Some of you may now also think of, yeah, that could be a situation, like let's say if you're giving a presentation, people may be looking at you, although looking and staring can be different. Um, but still, there are situations, in this case, in Toronto, and anybody is very welcome to visit Dr. Pinto here in Toronto. There is a place called Ripley Aquarium of Canada. And in here, they promote this in, along the subway that staring here is not strange or creepy at all. And actually, given how much the ticket actually costs, they actually recommend you do a lot of staring because you pay a good money to be there. And I heard there are many, many pretty um, fishes and thing that swim that 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 you want to stare at to stare at. The point of all this is staring in one context is not a good thing, but staring in another is actually something that people recommend you to do. So the the point here is then context matter. Now if I may link this back to economic evaluation. In economic evaluation, the question that you have set the context. Everything always going to go back to what is the questions that you want to know. Depending on your question, we do different type of economic evaluations. And here are the common questions that economic evaluation can help you answer. The first one is, let's say you have a standard of care or usual care option, and you have this new program or treatment and you want to know, compared to usual care, is this new program cost effective? That's something we can help with. And to do that, there's different type of analysis we can use to help you answer that question. Another question could be, you want to know how much the program costs. That's also a type of analysis we can help you with that. The third one is, how will the program affect the overall budget? That's also a type of analysis we can help you with. But I guess the main point here is really, these are the common questions. So thinking about your research, your program, are any of these questions something that you are interested in? Because if it is, then economic relation is certainly a technique for you to consider because we have different type of analysis that can help you answer this. Now if I can take a few more minutes then talking a little bit further about each type of each of the question. The first question here is really focus on how much does your program cost. It is a simple you know, you can view this as a as a simple accounting exercise. It will look at the cost description analysis or how much would it cost for you to implement this. This could happen, let's say, when you go to present your work and somebody were to approach you and said, what you just presented, that's sounds very relevant. I'm not from where you are, but I like to implement your program in my setting. How much resources do I need to make that happen? 
cost description analysis is what you need because they're pretty much asking you how much would it cost for them to do this. Another question, let's say, that we need a budget impact analysis is if you want to know how will your program affect the overall budget. Now, the cost description or the budget impact analysis, a lot of time, this is from my experience, is a question of interest for the decision makers when they are already thinking about the implementation. You're not trying to show them that this is a good value for money. They already bought into the idea. Now they're thinking about, well, what would be the resource you need and how will this affect my overall budget if I'm at the Ministry of Health per se. So with budget impact analysis, there are different framework and this is one of the examples that um, we can use to guide your analysis. But the key here for budget impact analysis is really to look at how will your program affect the overall budget. Uh, a quick example would be if you think about a very, very expensive drug, but it is for a rare disease. So even though the drug per person will cost a lot, but because the number of people that would need this drug is so small, the total budget may not be as big if you compare it to, let's say, a cheaper drug, but you got to give it to a bigger, a larger population because this condition is more common. So in the end, the total budget will differ. And that's what this budget impact is, is trying to get at. The last question of what we're going to be focusing on is the question of compared to usual care, is the new program cost effective? And we're going to be focused on, focusing on this question for the remaining 15 minutes or so. So this is an important question if you have a new program or a new device or a new technology and you're thinking, should I switch to this new program? You're comparing to the usual care or to the standard of care. And the usual care or standard of care could be that right now there is nothing in place. So you could be comparing to there's nothing in place right now. And right away you know that, yes, by doing something about it, the cost of the program would be more. But then remember that economic relation will look at both cost and your outcome. So even if you are paying more for something, we're also going to try to make a case that you are going to get more as well. So this is the third question. Now, to elaborate more on the third question, I like to do that by linking it back to general factors that you may want to consider when you're thinking about doing an economic evaluation or when you're thinking about whether you want to include this in your grant submission or when you're putting together your proposal. The first part that we already have talked about is the question. You want to think about are the questions that economic evaluation can help you answer, are those something that you or your stakeholder want to know? Because if, if it is, then we'll pass on to the second factor. So I'll be going through the other factors um, in the next few slides. But in general, these, the factors you may want to consider would include things like cost, effect, perspective, and budget or willingness to pay. So first, when you have two programs and you want to compare whether the new program is cost effective or not, there are different types of economic relations you can do. And these are them. So we got cost benefit analysis, cost utility, cost effectiveness analysis, cost minimization analysis, and cost consequent analysis. And all of them, even though they are different type of analysis, they all have one common thing. Well, they are type of analysis and they all have cost. And I like to think that the fact that cost is there in every single type of analysis and cost is also the first word. For me, I like to believe that gives me a hint that cost is an important variable when you want to do economic evaluation. Now, when you think about cost, there are many, many different definitions of cost. We got things like direct versus indirect cost, fixed versus variable cost, one-time, ongoing, startup, implementation. I would suggest that the rule of thumb that I often use in my work is to make sure that we, that whoever you're speaking with define cost the same way you do. So you can make it clear how you're defining cost 
so that other people who are looking at your work or reviewing your work, they know exactly what you mean when you say cost. Another way is if you already know that your stakeholder define cost in certain way, then you may want to define cost in the same way as well. There are people who use this term interchangeably, and there are people who use this term in different ways. And the last type of cost I want to mention is also opportunity cost. Our goal is always how can we use the resource we have for its best use. When you spend your dollar in something, it means you cannot spend it on something else. Opportunity cost focus on what you have giving up. When you have a new program, you are spending your time to, to implement that program. That's the time that you cannot spend to do something else. That's the opportunity cost. And depending on the question you want to answer, sometimes opportunity cost really is really important, but sometimes it may not be as much. But these are the general kind of different type of costs that people have mentioned or used. So back to the, our question. We have two programs. We want to know is the new program cost effective. The first thing you want to look at is what question you want to answer. Look at the cost, what it means to you. So all of them have cost. But if these are different types of analysis, then what makes them differ are the middle part. And the middle part is the outcome part. So when you want to do economic evaluation, you would need data on cost and outcome. Now cost, you know that they are in units of dollars. It could be U.S., it could be Canadian, it could be pounds, it could be any other unit. But you already know that dollar value has certain value. The outcome part, that's what determines which type of economic evaluation you would need. If your outcome is something that we can convert to dollar as well, then we can call that type of analysis cost-benefit analysis. So when you're reading a journal article and they said, they are doing a cost-benefit analysis. You know right away, without even looking at the abstract, if they say that in the title, that their outcome is in dollar. An example of such outcome could be things like hospitalization. So I'll use Canada as an example. In my experience, people who pay for things tend to be pretty good at keeping track of what they pay for. The ministry is the one who pay for hospitalization. So we have an administrative database that keeps track on how much the ministry have to spend for each hospitalization. So you can talk about length of stay or talk about one hospitalization, but those has a dollar value attached to it because the ministry did pay for those. So if we were to convert length of stay to dollar value, that would be a cost-benefit analysis. Now if your outcome is a quality adjusted life year or quality, Q-A-L-Y, then the type of analysis we'll do we'll call cost utility analysis. Now for this part, qual quality adjusted life year is a unique outcome because it combines two things. It combines how long a person lives with their quality of life. So if you're thinking about an intervention that allows a person to live for 10 years, that is a great thing. And this person can live for 10 years, and this person can do anything that he or she wants. So that's one intervention. Now there's another intervention, which is also good. Get this, it will get this patient to live for 10 more years. So live for 10 more years, that's a good thing. However, this person will have to stay on their bed. So they have to be bedridden. Again, um, I'm not sure I mentioned this, but this is a hypothetical example. So even though both of this group live for 10 more years, but their quality of life are likely to differ because one group can do anything that he or she wants, but the other group have to stay on the bed, right? So length of life would be the same. However, the quality of life would differ. Quality adjusted life year is a, an outcome that, that, that aims to capture both quality and length of life. Another interesting and unique characteristic of quality assessment life year is that it allows you to compare apple to orange. 
well, I mean, technically it makes the orange become apple. So if you're thinking about whether you want to fund, if you are in the decision making, maker position and you're thinking, should I fund a new drug for cancer or a new drug for mental health or a new drug for heart disease? That's a really good question. But they all have different outcomes. So how can you say that one drug is better than another? That is an example of when you have apple, orange, and maybe banana. But what if? What if we have an approach that allows you to create a standardized outcome, also known as quality assisted life year? So then your drug, different drugs, would then have the same outcome that would allow you to be able to compare, again, with assumption and limitations, but will allow you to actually use the evidence to help with your decision-making process. That's also another unique characteristic of quality. So if you see an article and it said they did a cost utility analysis, you also know right away that the outcome is quality adjusted life year. Now let's say if you uh, come to Dr. Pinto or me and said, but I have a really important clinical outcome. It could be a pain score, it could be um, patient satisfaction, it could be many other interesting clinical outcomes, then we'll say no problem. We can do cost effective analysis. We'll just use the outcome that you have as your primary outcome and we still can do economic evaluation. Now if you don't have an outcome or you are doing a let's say a non inferiority trial where you you know that the effectiveness of the um, of the two program would be the same, then you don't really need to look at the outcome and when you focus only on cost between the two groups, that is cost minimization analysis. CMA or cost minimization analysis is not something that we would consider first unless unless you know for certain that the, there's no difference in the outcome. Last but not least, if you have multiple outcome, outcomes, we can also do cost consequent analysis. So again, the, I think the, the, the key point or the main take home for this slide is that regardless of what your outcome is, there is a type of economic evaluation to help you if the question we can help you are something that you want to know. So we talk about the importance of questions, cost and effect. The next part I want to talk about that is crucial when we do economic evaluation is about perspective. Perspective is important because people tend to see things from where they stand. As you can see, the guy on the land is happy to see a boat, but the guy on the boat is happy to see the land. So people tend to see things from, from how it's relevant to them. So perspective is important when we do economic evaluation because it helps us determine which cost we want to include because cost for one person may not be a cost to another person. For example, again, I'll use, um, as we are in Canada at the moment, I like to use Canadian healthcare system as an example. Hospitalization is covered by the Ministry of Health. So that is a cost to the Ministry of Health. The patient has zero cost, right? So different perspective, there are different perspectives in healthcare. We have patient, hospital, industry, caregiver, health providers, clinicians, government, society as well. Societal perspective is a, is a perspective that includes everybody because we are part of the society. Now, as you can see that different perspectives are likely to have their own cause. So when you do the analysis with one perspective, you may get one finding. But if you do the analysis with another perspective, the finding could change. Um, a quick hypothetical example. So if we have an intervention that said instead of having the, making the patient having to stay in the hospital, now we're going to let them receive all the care at home. So the old version costs the ministry a lot because the patient have to be in the hospital and that's where the patient, I mean the ministry have to pay. However, when they go to, when they got moved into their home, the cost now shifts to mainly the patient and caregiver. There's still costs that for the, uh, the health provider the ministry will cover. But now, 
the cost to the caregiver or the family member increase because the patient is now home. So from the ministry perspective, this new approach, so helping people at home, could be cost effective because that cost reduced. But from the family member perspective, the cost will actually increase. So the the perspective you choose when you want to do an economic relation will affect your findings as well. And in many cases, you may not have to pick one. It could be that you will conduct more than or consider more than one analysis. And we often do that at our center as well when we do the, the payer perspective and we also do societal perspective. The last part that I like to talk about or something for you to consider is around the importance of budget. So when you want to consider investing in something, you want to know the price and the value or the price and what you're going to get. And this is applicable. We apply this concept every day. So when you have more than one option, you're going to look at how much it's going to cost you for each option. You're going to look at what you're going to get. It could be a technology. It could be a device. It could be a medication, right? How much does the drug cost? What is the, um, what the survival analysis show us? What is the added number of years? You're going to look at price and value. But another thing that you will want to look at as well is your budget or like the capi capital one, I believe, credit card say, what's in your wallet? So in general, if what you want is more than your budget, you are supposed to say no. But if what you want is less than your budget, then, then we can talk and then we can think about what we can do. So to summarize in terms of general factors to consider, when you're thinking about do I, do I need economic relation, do I want to do this, or should I include this in my grant submission? But think about the questions that we can help you answer. Are those relevant? Do you want to know if your program cost effective? If you do, economic relation could help you with that. Now, if you you know that you answer yes to yes, these are the questions that we want to know, then you may want to think about the cost. Do you want to think about the effect or the outcome, which you already know in terms of the outcome, because when you plan your study, that is your primary outcome. You may want to also consider whose perspective you want to look at. Would it be the payer? Would it be the public payer, third-party payer, the insurance family member, or would it be societal, meaning would it be everybody? And last part, you want to think about the willingness to pay. And I'll elaborate a little bit more about what I mean by willingness to pay in the next part. So I'm now going to get into our last question together, which is to focus on what does cost-effective mean? Now, in your work, I'm certain that you work, you have seen and used um, p-value quite a bit when you do hypothesis testing, when you're trying to do your statistical analysis. If p-value is less than 0 0.05, you would say that this new treatment is significantly better, worse, or different than the usual care on whichever outcome that you're focusing on. Economic relations in a lot of time does not rely on p-value. Economic relation is about two things. The first one we want to give you is creating a cost effectiveness estimate. We want to give you an estimate that will give you an estimate that will represent the cost effectiveness of your program, your intervention. And that's just one part. We are also going to give you the uncertainty of that estimate. So when you do economic relation, you want to look at two things. What is the estimate? What's the uncertainty? These are the exa they are examples of cost effectiveness estimates. We have one that's called ICER or incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And it will tell you, compared to usual care, how much would it cost for the new program to get one extra unit of your outcome of interest. Your outcome can be anything. If I'm thinking about a fall prevention program, this will either will tell me, compared to usual care, how much do I have to pay for this new program to reduce one fall, right? So the outcome can be anything. The other estimate is called incremental net benefit. 
And this one will give you tell you the extra net benefit of your program compared to usual care. For today, given the time we have, I like to focus mainly on the ICER, but here are the equations for both of them. But focusing on ICER, as you can see here, the equation itself is simply the difference in cost divided by difference in effect. Difference is also represented by the delta symbol, so delta C divided by delta E. That is the formula for ICER. And that will tell us the difference in cost between the two groups per different in effect between the two groups. That is how we look at both cost and outcome together. So if I link back a little bit to when you want to buy something, so you have more than one option. You're going to look at the price. You're going to look at what you're going to get. That is your ISA. ISA combines the two parts together for you into one estimate. But as we were talking, in addition to knowing the price and what you're going to get, you may also need to know about your budget. That is your willingness to pay and your budget. So if your ICER is more than your budget or how much you're willing to pay, then it's not cost effective. But if your ICER is less than that willingness to pay, then it is cost effective. So linking it back to the question that we have. So compared to usual care, is the new program cost effective? ISA will give us how much it would cost to get one more unit of outcome or effect. For something to be cost effective, your ISA has to be your has to be less than your willingness to pay. You know your ISA, right? You got your cost, you got your outcome. It can be from your study. You can call out, collect it in your clinic. That's the information we have now. Willingness to pay or the budget, that's where perspective come in, depending on who are you talking about. The people who are making decisions or have to, who have to think about whether they want to pay for this, they're likely to know how much money they have. But in a lot of times, if you change perspective, the budget may change. Or there are many other ways as well that the budget can change. So in a lot of time, even though you know the answer, you may not know the willingness to pay. So unless you know the willingness to pay, you will not take you technically cannot say whether something is cost effective or not. Right. So we have talked about it in uh, the definition, we talk about the formula. The last thing I'd like to leave you with is actually how do we present this information in the figure? Right? And we use a plot, and it's called cost effectiveness plan. The vertical line is the delta C, or different in cost. The horizontal line is the delta E, or different in effect. If you're comparing two programs, the so new program minus the old program, if something costs more, it's going to be something along in the top part. If something costs less, it's going to be there in the bottom part. Now, if something is better, has a better outcome, you, your delta E is going to be positive, so you're going to be on the right side of the plot. If something is less effective, it's going to be there. Now I think you would agree with me that you probably want to be in the lower right quadrant, where you pay less and you get more. And you, you probably don't want to be in the upper left, where you pay more, you get less. So for me, those are something that are clearer to decide whether something is cost effective or not. However, in a lot of time, we are area of pay more, get more, or pay less and get less. So in those times, then the question becomes, how much are you willing to pay? So on this plot, you can show your answer. And for people who like equations and plot, if you think about the slope of a line, from the origin to either. That's the slope of that line is y over x. Our y is delta c, our x is delta e. So your slope of the line is your either. Now remember, either is one part. We got to know about the budget. So if our budget is more than your either, so the either dot is below the willingness to pay line, then you know that your program is cost effective. But if your willingness to pay line is below 
your ISA, which means your ISA is greater than your willingness to pay, then you know that it's not cost effective. So all this we can summarize into one picture. Now, at the beginning of this section, the last question here, I mentioned that in addition to give you the estimate, I also like to give you the uncertainty of the estimate as well, because we can never be 100% certain. And here I like to show the, uh, an example of, of why it's very, very important to consider the uncertainty. So we have this new treatment called treatment A compared to usual care. It's in the upper right quadrant, which means treatment A compared to usual care is more costly and more effective. Okay, I can see that you pay more, you get more. That could work. Then another drug, we're looking at drug X compared to its standard of care. Okay? We're not comparing A and X. So X is comparing to its own control. Drug X is actually cost less and more effective. So by looking at the estimate itself, you may be leaning toward, well, I pay less, I get more. How can we say no to that? Right? I mean, drug A, I mean, treatment A is good, but you pay more, you get more. But for X, we actually pay less and we get more. We shouldn't say no to things like that. That's where uncertainty comes in. If I show you that here's the uncertainty around each estimate. So for treatment A, you know that 95% of the time, you're going to pay more, but you're going to get more. There's no surprise there. You know that. But when you look at drug X, 50% of the time, yes, you pay less, you get more. But there's like 10% of the time that you actually pay more, you get less. And there's like 25% where you pay less, you get less. So you're not quite sure. There are higher level of uncertainty. So the question is now become how much uncertainty can you handle or how much risk are you willing to take? That's why when we're thinking about, when we're looking at the estimate, thinking about the estimate, you would want to look at the uncertainty of the cost effectiveness estimate as well. So that kind of summarizes um, the three questions that I would like uh, to share with you. So, but quickly before we turn on, turn over to the Q and A part, I like to answer the question of when should we consider economic evasion? So technically, ideally, it would be great if we could consider this right up front when you are doing the planning stage, because in that case, you can think about when you're writing your grant, what are the items you want to look at the questions, cost, outcome, perspective, willingness to pay, what estimate would you need, what are the uncertainty you're going to consider. You can look at that. And if you're thinking about doing this in the beginning, it also prevents something like this from happening. I think it would be really great if the guy who's putting in the electric plug actually talked to the guy who's putting in the water uh, faucet because then something like this would not happen. But if that's not possible, it's OK. You can consider it when you're already collecting data. You can even consider it at the end of the study. After you publish your article, when you are after you've already presented this at your preferred conference, somebody could come up to you and say, wow, the effectiveness is really significant. Now, is this program cost effective? That could be the time as well that you're thinking about, well, maybe we want to think about economic evaluation. So I think. The short answer for this question of when to consider economic evaluation is really about in your work, in your research, anytime you're thinking about cost, anytime you're thinking about trade-off or the value for money, that was maybe the time that economic evaluation could help. So in summary, we care about economic evaluation because in a lot of time, we have limited or fixed resources, so we have to make choices. And economic evaluation is a technique, a tool that can help you create evidence to help when you need to make those choices. When something is cost effective, you need to know both the cost, the outcome, and also how much you're willing to pay. Here I prepare cover a list of things that you may want to include or consider when you're thinking about writing a grant submission and including an economic evaluation to it. And last but not least, I like last but not least, I like to emphasize and highlight that the overall goal of economic evaluation is to create evidence to help 
you and your stakeholder when you have to make a decision. And to finish, I'd like to share with you a quote from Michael Angelo, who said, every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. All of you are an expert in your field. You know how to make the, your, your area better. You have ideas on different interventions, different devices, different programs. In addition to knowing that something works, if you think that knowing is cost effectiveness, knowing whether your program is, is a good value for money or not can help as well, then economic evaluation could be a technique for you to consider as well. So with that, I'll finish. Um, thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Juan Rudy. Um, and we uh, are now going to just move to the question um, uh, question sort of part. We have about nine minutes to go. Um, and people should be able to share questions through the chat function uh, um, on, your, on your screen. Okay, uh, I'm going to just start with one question that is uh, fairly sort of practical, which is maybe one or you can talk about when people are starting to think about this as a method, and they oftentimes it's about building it into a study that they're about to conduct. Are there some tips that you could share with people about just some key things key buckets of questions or data areas that people should be thinking about trying to collect that will make their job sort of easier. Thank you, Andrew, for, for that question. And so looking back at the list of the general factors to consider, so when you're preparing a study, you already know kind of an idea of what the program or the treatment, the intervention would be, right? Now, the next thing when you talk to a biostatistician or putting something together, people are going to ask you, well, the, what's your primary outcome? What are you trying to improve? So for me, when you're thinking about study, you're already thinking about those. The third part, I think, or the first part for the economic evaluation would be about the cost part. Mm -hmm. If you think that cost will play an important role in any way, whether it's going to cost less, mm -hmm. it's going to cost more, or it's going to reduce cost in other areas, that's when I think it could, like thinking around, like would, how, would this affect the cost to the system, the cost to the family? If you think, if you answer yes to any of those, then I think it may be um, helpful to consider it further about, well, is that something we can do to capture those information so we can also show the benefit of the program, of the study as well. And I think uh, a lot of time that capture in the term like value, because to me, when people talk about value, value captures so many things. Clinical benefit is one value, mm -hmm. but reduction in cost could be another value as well, right? So it's just to take one step further after you have your program, after you have your, your uh, outcome, and think, OK, is there something about dollar, about cost that you want to consider? And also, sorry, um, to interrupt. And also, to if you answer yes, then ca how can you incorporate that when you are thinking about data collection, right? So asking people how they are feeling that's one part, but um, maybe there to get to get cost, that may be other way to collect the data too. And we have a couple of questions okay. that have been emailed in, which is great. One question was about, would it be possible to provide a list of readings or papers to read about more? And that's absolutely something that our work group can develop. And, and you know, we can ask uh, people like Juan Rudy for suggestions. But I think that's a great suggestion, something that we can put on our website, uh, some, some example reading. Yeah. Another um, uh, question is, that just came in was, could a future webinar walk us through examples? And yes, actually, so that's a great uh, reminder. So our next webinar is going to be focused more on examples. And again, that's going to be on June the 22nd 
from 12 to 1 Eastern Time, and it will be with Dr. Ahmed Bayoumi, another uh, wonderful colleague here at St. Mike's in Toronto. Um, and then I'm going to just turn to a third question that came in, which to turn it to Juan Rudy, what techniques are used mm -hmm. to produce the uncertainty around an estimate? So that's a great question. Yes. So thank you for that question. And just, and just to follow up on a couple of points, I could also send you a few readings that I often use as well. And right, so uncertainty. So uncertainty, the picture that you have seen earlier, these sometimes are, uh, oh, sorry, wrong direction. These can be created by what we call is confident ellipse. So when we want to show uncertainty, just like in other type of statistical analysis, we deal with well, what is the distribution of the data. Sometimes, if you know the distribution of the data, you can do any you can do parametric uh, approach to create uncertainty. But sometimes, if you do not know, and a lot of time, like cost data, is not normal distribution. So then we also explore to the approach like a non-parametric approach to create uncertainty. What you're looking at here. This is something like uh, we create what we call is confident ellipse. It is created, uh, it's one of the parametric approach, which means you assume you know the distribution and there are ways for you to check. But in general, just like when you do other statistical analysis, you can also create 95% confident interval for your ICER as well. There are limitations in the way that your ICER or incremental cost effectiveness ratio is a ratio. Because of that, statistically, sometimes it can be challenging to interpret what the 95% confident interval would be. And because of that reason, that's why other estimates like incremental net benefit was created. And that's why using pictures to create um, uncertainty was created, because it go ar get around some of the statistical limitation of a ratio. Um, so I mentioned 95% confident interval, confident ellipse. Sometimes people also create what they call a cost effectiveness acceptability curve. That is also another way for you to show the uncertainty as well. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Um, uh, so what are typical or standard components to include in a cost description of a, of a health intervention? So maybe like what are the major components of cost uh, description analysis? Right. Thank you for that question. So cost is, is the question you're trying to answer there is just how much does it cost? So in the end, I think there would be the total budget that the stakeholder or the decision maker is looking for. A lot of times, what we break down, we will break down by category of cost, but these are just the general component like you uh, uh, in your question. It could be modified to fit with your program. So common component we include are things like personnel cost, right? Uh, if there are training involved, you may want to separate those, or material and supply, facility, uh, facility cost, uh, facility or overhead cost. Those are the category um, that the, the general category we use. And in a lot of time, personnel cost tend to be one of the major components. Um, when you do cost description analysis, you can also separate by time period. For example, if you want to look at, well, that's a one-time cost or the cost to set up the program. So within the first six months, how much does it cost, right? So there's a one-time cost that you've got to invest, and then there's a cost you need to maintain the program. Within a lot of time, it could be lower than the overall cost as well. So by type of cost, or by time period. Those are something we could consider too. Um, there's another really great question which is very practical, which is where do you get the cost <laughs> in estimates? Where are the sources we should look for? I'll just jump in on that. Like a very, from my experience doing a few studies, is it, it can be quite challenging. It, it, it really depends on your context. Here in Ontario, when we're looking at um, at studies, we actually have a few references that we can use that are have been uh, developed by our Ministry of Health of estimates of cost for some specific things, such as uh, the cost of a hospital stay, um, the cost of a medication that's paid for by the government. 
so we we have a um, uh, a more centralized uh, set of, of costs that can be used and that have been sort of um, uh, generalized. There is an important difference between sort of the cost of something and the charge that mm -hmm. people would face. But I'll turn it to Juan Rudy if there's any sort of suggestions that you have for people. Um, thank you. So I absolutely agree with, with your reply, uh, and Andrew. And uh, I think if I could add one thing, it would be refer back to to my point that people who pay for something tend to know how much they pay for it. So Ministry will know through admin database that they keep record on what they pay for. But if you're interested in cost to the patient or to the family, then you need you are thinking about primary data collection because the only people who are gonna know how much you know John Smith pay for something would be John Smith or his family, right? So think about who is paying for this, whose cost is it, and those would be that may give you a kind of a starting point on where to get it. Hey, this Hi, is Richard I, Young. I just throw in there that in the U.S., I would say by far the most common source for the big cost, so the cost of you know hospitalizations or whatever, is it, going to be the Medicare fee schedule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm just noting the time. We're just at 1:02. We're, we're going to need to wrap up. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it was really wonderful. Thank you so much to Juan Rudy for sharing your expertise. Uh, it was just a fantastic kickoff. Um, we are hoping to send around an evaluation. And please do fill that out because this helps us with planning future uh, webinars. And also, please let us know if you'd like to get involved with this working group as we try to build sort of a community of folks in uh, primary care doing this research. And finally, this webinar is being is, has been recorded. We're going to hopefully that all works out. And, uh, and once we test that out, we'll probably circulate that. And please feel free to share that with your network. So thank you again, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.